Welcome to everybody to our Zoom talk series for the Wrapped in Color Legacies of the Mexican Serapi exhibit. I'm Lisa Falk, I'm head of community engagement at the museum, and I'll serve as your host. Um, as many of you know, the Arizona State Museum is part of the University of Arizona. We're located in Tucson. We're situated on land that's been home to indigenous peoples for 13,000 years. And today, the Tucson area is home to the Atam and Pasco Yaqui. And there are 22 federally recognized tribes with reservation lands in the state of Arizona. The museum's collection and research focus on the indigenous peoples of the Southwest and Northwest Mexico. And we present programs exploring the history and cultures of this region. And now let me introduce tonight's speaker, Navajo tapestry weaver, Linda Teller Pete. For over seven generations, Linda and her family have produced award-winning rugs in the traditional Two Gray Hills regional style. Along with her weaving, she's collaborating with fiber art centers, museums, universities, fiber guilds, and other art venues to educate the public about Navajo history and the presentation, preservation of Navajo weaving traditions. In fact, she's zooming in right now from Santa Fe where she's been consulting with a the museum there on an exhibit, she's very busy. Linda and her sister Barbara and Alice wrote Spider Women's Children, Navajo Weavers Today, which is the first book written about Navajo weavers by Navajo weavers. Their second book is How to Weave a Navajo Rug and Other Lessons from Spider Woman. Linda also collaborated with three authors on the book, Navajo Textiles, the Crane Collection at the Denver Museum of Natural Nature and Science. Linda has a Bachelor of Science degree in Criminal Justice and Public Programs from Arizona State University. She's originally from the Two Gray Hills Newcomb, New Mexico area of the Navajo Nation and now lives in Denver, Colorado. During the Q&A following Linda's presentation, she'll be joined by Porfirio Gutierrez, the co-curator of the Wrapped in Color exhibit, who is a master textile artist and natural dyer. He was born and raised in a historic Zapotec textile community at Tenochtitlan del Valle in Oaxaca, Mexico, and now runs his own studio in Ventura, California. And so at this point, Linda, I'm going to turn it over to you and just let me know when you want your PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I, I'm very honored to take part um, in, in this presentation tonight. Uh, Linda Teller um, my name is Linda Teller P. I am of the Edgewater clan and for the two waters that flow together. And I am originally from the Two Gray Hills and uh, Newcomb, New Mexico area of the Navajo Nation. And uh, I live in Denver, Colorado with my husband, Belvin Pete, who is uh, also from a Navajo weaving family. In fact, his, his mother was a weaving teacher, Al. And uh, my sister, Barbara uh, Teller Arnalis and I have been teaching Navajo weaving for mm, about 20, 21 years or so. And, um, you know, we, we have been, our, our lives, I think, have really been entwined in how we grew up. And um, when I was asked to do the, uh, this little presentation, I thought about um, how other weaving styles, other um, nationalities have really influenced the way that we weave. And um, uh, in, in my uh, teaching career, I've encountered a lot of students that are uh, Rio Grande weavers that, um, that some do it professionally. And I've been very lucky to have been um, exposed to a lot of their styles of, of what they weave. And I started really thinking about um, you know, the, the history of, of how both of our histories have really entwined. And um, I, I'm not a scholar of Zapotecs or Chimayo, Rio Grande and Satillos. So what I, I would like to talk about tonight is how those styles have influenced myself and my family on a personal um, in, in our personal weaving experiences. And that would be the, the topic of my, um, my presentation tonight. Um, but I've, I feel very honored today to, to um, present that to you. Um, and I had a, a very good day today. I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico um, today and tomorrow. And I've been going through some old rugs and I feel like the ancestors are with me. I've been able to, um, with my gloved hands, 
I've been able to put my hands on some old um, uh, third phase chief blankets. I saw some child's blankets. I saw um, a lot of, um, 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 you know, uh, uh, textiles that were woven in the 1800s. And that really spurred me on today um, with this topic because I talk, uh, I thought about my mother and how, how weaving histories have affected her. And I also thought about my grandmothers, both my paternal and um, maternal grandmothers. And they were, they were both weavers and how it influenced them. And uh, so, you know, that there are um, uh, a lot of similarities between the, the, um, um, the Zapotec weavers, the Satillo weavers, Rio Grande, Chamayo weavers, and Navajo weavers. You know, our history is very entwined. We all were subject to colonization. We were all subject to um, uh, rulings from um, from from the Spaniards and from uh, colonial people, and how that influenced our weaving to this day. And there's there's a lot of uh, heartbreak associated with that. And sometimes it, it is a little bit hard to talk about. And I understand why my mother never really, you know, talked about it. Um, but I know that um, she knew a lot about her um, her mother-in-law, which is my paternal grandmother, and how her mother was probably a, um, what people would call a servant, but I say slave. Um, there's power in words, and some some days I read books and. Uh, go through people's uh, essays and papers. And I see that they're very careful about the words that they use. But again, that to me, that sort of um, uh, trying to be um, um, maybe politically correct, but we need to be truthful. We need to be truthful about our histories. And there definitely was a slave period. And, um, and that's really how the design sort of got influenced by a lot of different um, uh, weavers. You know, the um, one thing that I hear a lot is, you know, the Navajos learn how to weave from, you know, the Spaniards. They learn how to weave from, you know, this and that. Yes, there was a mixture of uh, communities that was spurred by warfare, intermitch, um, uh, you know, it, and, the, the trades, um, because in the in the early 1800s there were um, definite factions at, at at play, and and I know that our our looms have really gone through a lot of different styles. Um, our our weaving has had gone through a lot of different styles. So there's been a lot of mixture of um, weaving styles, and for for um, for history to kind of, um, you know, navigate on a narrow path when actually there's just a lot more at play. And um, I think Navajo weavers today are becoming more vocal about that. And especially even within my family, because in my mother's day and in my uh, elder aunts and our grandmother's day, everything was hugged. Hush. They didn't like to talk about the heartbreaks. They didn't like to talk about how their weaving was influenced, how they were suppressed. They were suppressed by weaving with color. They were suppressed by weaving with, um, uh, you know, hand spun, um, using commercial uh, products. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with using commercial um, uh, yarns or wool if you uh, clarify it, you know, if you... Um, come out and say, yeah, this is commercial, but I've, I've respun it or whatever. And so there's so much there. And, um, and, and instead of me, you know, talking to you about the, uh, what I know about history, I'm just going to talk about my family and how we were influenced by, um, um, by the styles that we, we, we saw a lot of. And um, my, my father was a trader at Tuber Hills Trading Post for 35 years. And he had been surrounded by Navajo weaving. But every once in a while, there might be a weaving that the, the trader uh, would get a hold of. 
And we were fascinated by it because there were uh, things in there that we looked at and said, is that Navajo or is that Navajo? You know, and so that really spurred some, some uh, curiosity on our parts. As kids growing up at the training post, we were always surrounded with um, uh, foreign things that we saw. You know, we, we saw a lot of tourists. We saw um, uh, uh, non-English speakers coming into our home, into my mother's, uh, look at my mother's weed. And sometimes they bought her weedings right off the loom. And later on, we would get um, newspapers or whatever in, in the mail and it would be in different languages. And it, we would see my mom at her room and the, 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 um, the tapestry that she sold them. So for me, my whole world was around um, looking and learning about rugs, um, our rugs, and how they traveled. And so I was very influenced by um, my, my, father, my father's knowledge of rugs and how I became very curious about history. And so I'm going to start my PowerPoint with that. Lisa, if you want to um, turn that on. I introduced myself that I am of the Edgewater clan, born for two uh, waters that flow together. And all Navajos like to introduce themselves that way so that we know who um, our relatives are, if there are any that are uh, close by. Okay, next slide. The next slide has um, my generation of weavers in my family, and it started with uh, my grandmother, uh, Susie Tom, who's my mother's mom, and her mother is the Netsu Ibitsit. They were collaborative weavers, and just like them, my older sisters, Roseanne Lee and uh, Barbara, were collaborative weavers. And now Barbara is a collaborative weaver with her son, Michael. And so the tradition of collaborative weaving has, uh, it is continued into, um, um, to this day. My mother is gone now. She passed in 2014, but she was very, um, uh, she was very dedicated to preparing her own materials. She, um, my, my, um, uh, maternal aunt Margaret Yazi had her own flock of sheep and they favored that red brown sheep. I don't know if you can see any of those photos, but the red brown was very prized for our inside field color. If you see the tapestry that's up on the upper um, corner, um, the inside field color is kind of reddish and it's kind of brownish. And that's the color that we favored. And um, for a long time, you know, we were all considered two gray hill weavers. And when Barbara tried to, uh, in, uh, uh, when she tried to do other styles, she was um, suppressed <laughs> by our mom and our aunts. Um, you know, when she came home, she was told, you can't do that. You're a two gray weaver. You can't be weaving other styles. You can't be using dyed wool and all of that. And Barbara's answer to that was, I've got to feed my family. And I've got to focus on what sells. And, um, you know, and uh, when Michael, her son, and he's pictured in, in the um, their photo, he's wearing the, the dark blue shirt. Um, he he um, would want to weave a different style. And then Barbara would say, you can't do that. And uh, so Michael said to his mother, uh, didn't you try to get out of this mold like with your mother too? And then Barbara would catch herself and say, yeah, you're right. Michael, you are free to weave whatever you want. And our granddaughter, Roxanne, um, she is 20. Um, we started her off when she was about four years old. And her father, uh, Terry, was our main tool maker. But uh, unfortunately, he passed on um, last year. And But we still have a lot of his tools. His tools will be around um, uh, with us, it will be, you know, used when it, it, if Roxanne has grandchildren, they will use his tools. And so we keep a lot of things that we make in the family. And that's my my um, generation of um, uh, weavers in my family. And even though we were labeled two Great Hill weavers, we are branching out, we're uh, creating our own pathway into doing abstracts. And, and this is where the influence of 
um, what we see in satio weavings in, in uh, Rio Grande blankets um, have influenced our, our work as well. So next slide. We start with what is similar. And um, no, I'm sorry, we start with what is different and our looms are different. Um, this is our, our relatives from Kenyon Diche and um, the, the elder is weaving on a metal loom. That metal loom was welded. And so, um, and it's very, very heavy. So she really doesn't need to have like braces or anything for her to pull her, um, her rugs with. And one thing about her um, metal loom is that it does look portable, but it's actually very, very heavy. And on the other photo, uh, my cousin Rosalita has a, a, a wood loom and it has the rope in it. And um, we, when we were growing up, we did not weave with ropes. We always use um, metal turnbuckles and that's because our weaving is so fine and you can't achieve that with ropes, but um, they're, they're weaving, um, Rosalita and her mother, Louise, uh, use commercial wool. Um, basically, I think they're, they use brown sheep uh, wool in worsted weight and then in sport weight. And so, um, you know, the, the uh, ropes are, are, are fine for that. Um, and then the next photo has, or, or the next slide has, um, has a, a photo of a walking loom and um, and then my little compact loom. That The loom that I'm standing by is a collapsible loom. You can take out the bolts and you can have a project still on it. You roll it up and, and take all the other pieces and you sort of pad them. And then I put it into a tube and I, I travel with it like that. And I am actually in Peru with this loom and what was really interesting about this is that uh, it was during um, Tenkui, which was a gathering of weavers from all over the globe. And uh, Barbara and I were invited to do a presentation on Navajo weaving. And so they were very fascinated with my little loom there. And um, when I came back to the United States and I unpacked that loom, some of my metal hardware were missing. Um, I, one of the eye bolts was missing, I, I, uh, a turnbuckle was missing, my metal rod was missing, and the bolts that I had taken out from the, the four corner side, there was one set that was missing. And I, I did not think it was um, uh, malicious, I think just curiosity. And I laughed and I thought, I wonder if the person that was checking my loom was uh, whose family are weavers. And they were fascinated with this loom, and um, and and I I didn't exactly feel like um, uh, like th there was a theft going on. It was more curiosity. And actually, I I was like, well, you know, I'm maybe when I go back to Peru in a, in a couple years, I'm going to see a loom like this. But you know, that's how a lot of the trades happen. That's how we influence other weavers. And um, the other things that are, are different is our warps are um, continuous. When we warp, it's a figure eight style. So we have a continuous warp and um, the other style will have cut warps. And we always have selvage cords. We have binding cords on the bottom and top and on sides. And I like to use colored selvage. And I started doing that a lot when I learned how to dye. And I, and I like the way that it frames a, a lot of the tapestries that I do. So I'm changing a lot of the way that I used to weave from when I started out, you know, when six years old. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm still growing and I'm still learning a lot, a lot about Navajo weaving. Next slide. Okay, so um, uh, thank you to uh, Arizona State Museum. I was able to get into their photos and I was actually really looking for photos that I could show you that would show you, that would, um, that would show you um, like the Zapotec weaving of what a, uh, um, the tree of life looks like and a Navajo tree of life, um, a Tiznaz pus, 
and um, you know all these different styles that they did. But I could only find a few photos there that matched up with what our family did. On the um, on the right hand side is a third phase chief blanket that is uh, a zapatak, and um, it it has. If you see the uh, serrated diamonds, there the angles are very sharp. And everything else looks very similar, and it's got the um, the nine design motifs in it, just like a just like a normal chief blanket. Um, but it doesn't have tassels. It doesn't have, um, and I don't think it has lazy lines in it. Um, the lazy lines are very indicative of Navajo weaving, and not not, not so much in Satillo weavings. Um, and on the uh, left side is Barbara's um, third phase chief blanket. And it's geometric, the, the, the nine motifs that you see are geometric. And those are a variant of uh, spider woman crosses. And it's really interesting that when I was going through our family photos and a lot of the um, historical weavings that we've done, the spider woman crosses are very prominent. And I started looking at other Navajo weavers work. And even though they are using the, the serrated diamonds from the Satios, you can, you can see that they've, uh, they will have woven in um, uh, spider woman crosses, whether they're on the corners or centered right in the middle, they're, they're there. And, it's, and to me, it just says, um, yes, this is a, a, a design based on satio weavings, but it was woven by a Navajo. And that's what I pick up from it. Okay, next slide. And um, the weaving on the left is a very classic uh, satio with the serrated diamonds in the, in the middle. And it's got the fringe on top and on the bottom. And I don't believe that it has the uh, the real thin stripes, but it does have that clear indigo um, wool that's woven in. And on the, the the right hand side is Barbara's weaving, and even though it does look very angle, she didn't weave it with angles. She wove it in a geometric style, but it, it from far away it really looks like the lone serrated um, diamonds. And as you can see, right in the middle, she put in two spider woman crosses. And those spider woman crosses are very prominent in a lot of um, historical weavings that I've seen that still carry on the, um, the Satillo designs that are, that are um, uh, very prominent in their weaving. And the, the Moki stripes there, the black and, and blue, uh, indigo blue stripes, um, I learned something very recently about those stripes. Uh, there is a young weaver by the name of Kevin Aspis, and he was in a, in, in a weaving group uh, forum, and he brought up the fact that he has a friend that is Hopi, um, and it, it, does, it, it does say in several... Um, uh, publications that it, it's these stripes are called Moki and they're 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 named for the Hopi tribe um but I don't think the Hopis wove that and so he asked his friend who is a Hopi member what he thought of those stripes and the, the uh his friend said that it wasn't a very good word to use and that uh we shouldn't be using that Moki word and so the forum you know, we had a little bit of discussion about that. And um, somebody said, Joe Ben, we named it a Mexican pelt or something. So it's very interesting to hear everybody's viewpoints. And uh, like I said, I have been a weaver for many, many years, but I'm always finding new information. And I'm grateful for that because it enriches my education, but it also influences um, what I weave as well. So I do plan on weaving more in the style. And I know Barbara does because that's one of her favorite things to do. She's very regimented in how her designs look. Um, but we will be educating people uh, about you know, what they're called and that um, we, we, we probably need to look for another word besides monkey. Um, but 
for us, you know, it, it's been in our uh, weaving repertoire for many, many years. So it's kind of hard to switch to a different word. Next slide. Okay, so that's a, um, the, the weaving on the right um, is a classic child's blanket and that's a, a satillo. And um, uh, although it, I, I kind of looked at it later on and I saw that they have like the tassels, the selvage cord. So I don't know if this is actually a Navajo one and not a satillo, I have no idea. But I have seen several um, designs like this in, in, in the Zapotec styles. And I and I know that they don't have the the selvages and they certainly don't have the tassels. But this is Barbara's weaving. It's a child's blanket, and this is one of her plainer ones. If you if you want to know the truth, she usually packs in a lot of design. Um, and again, she has that um, her homage to Spider Woman, and uh, it's a different variant of the Spider Woman crosses in the middle, and she. Um, uh, put in the, the little uh, uh, lightning panels on the bottom and on the top. But again, those are not angled. They, those are geometric um, steps and very, in, very indicative of a Navajo weaving. And the, the wool that she has is, um, is an aniline dye and it's commercially purchased. It was really thick. And so what Barbara did was she unspun it stretched it out and respun it to get that fine weft. So Barbara is known for a real high weft count in her tapestries. And that that's another thing. I want to backtrack back to the looms that we have. Uh, a lot of our students will come into class and they'll say, I've never used a tapestry loom before, or I've never woven a tapestry. And we say, our looms are not tap, you know, they're not called tapestry looms. They're just Navajo vertical upright looms. And, and for us, the word tapestry relates to the weight of the wool. So we have blankets, which is a real heavy weave. We have rugs, which is a mid weight weave. And then we have tapestry. Tapestry is a real high weft count uh, type of weaving. And Barbara can weave up to about 122 wefts weft count and that means in a one inch measurement your weft goes back and forth 122 times and that's how fine her her spinning is and uh, the highest I've gotten is probably about a 114 and uh, I'm not that fine of a spinner as as Barbara is but she will take commercial wool and if I find a color that I like in, in commercial wool, I'll take it to her and she'll unravel it for me and she'll respin it and it matches up with the, the weight of my other uh, wool. And, um, but her styles, when, when Barbara started doing child's blankets, she was very elaborate. Um, you know, it, it's, it's almost eye dazzling sort of. Um, and for some reason, the only one that I could I could find right away was this particular one that she wove and it doesn't have a lot of um, uh, designs in it, but to me, it's very formal. Um, it's very formal because you have the, um, you, you have the lightning uh, running from the top and the bottom, and then you have your spider woman crosses um, on, on either side. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this one, uh, to me, it, it um, I just named it a Germantown eye dazzler. I don't know if it is. I know that it came from the, the, um, the ASM collections and, and I'm, I'm assuming that it's a Satio weaving and um, the colors are fantastic. Um, in 1821, Mexico gained its independence from Spain. And right along that time, the Santa Fe Trail really opened up the trade. And when that happened, you know, a lot of the wools from Germantown started flooding the Southwest markets and also, you know, in, down into Mexico. And it, it, I think that the, the colors that were used are very reminiscent of the eye dazzler. 
And we don't, um, I, I haven't certainly woven anything like that. Um, I know Barbara has, I just couldn't find the photo. And I know my, my nephew Michael has, and I couldn't find the, those photos either. But I did find Melissa Cody's weaving. And when I saw, it, I see a lot of her stuff um, at Indian Market or at Herd's Fair. And I'm always fascinated with her use of color, her sharp angles, and how abstract she works. And I'm very um, intrigued by her processes. And so when I looked at this, um, the Satia the, the one, it immediately gave me um, uh, the desire to look at Melissa's. And I thought, I'm gonna put them side by side um, and take a look at, at, at how they sort of match up. And so the colors are sort of similar. Um, and you notice, that Melissa also put in three different variants of the Spider Woman crosses. And again, very Navajo, very, um, you know, she, she pays homage to Spider Woman. And she also is, uh, it, it, you can tell that it's a Melissa Cody's weaving because she's very distinct in her designs and her colors. And um, uh, she does all of her own dyeing she um i think uses synthetic dyes we we try to stick with natural and you know and uh, weavers usually have a preference they either like to use just all natural or they like to use synthetic dyes and some people like to match um i don't do that only because my um uh, when i sell my pieces to collectors i don't know how the synthetic is going to age I don't know if it will age along the patina with along with the patina of a natural um, uh, a natural wool or a natural dyed wool. So I, I kind of like to just stick to that and hopefully it ages gracefully. But I do like her bursts of color. Um, it's it's it just it 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 makes me happy to look at it because it's um, um, there's so many different and I'm sure like Michael Arnalis's weavings, you can turn it any way and you're going to see something different in it. And um, I, you know, I, I don't know what her weaving is called, but I'm pretty sure it has a very interesting name. Next weaving. Okay, so I, um, I talked a little bit about suppression. Um, in our history, we have been, um, Navajo weavers have been suppressed a lot by trading post people. You know, they kind of tell you what to weave, um, what will sell, what will not sell. And um, I'm going to relate a story of my, um, my maternal grandmother, Susie Tom. And it's a heartbreaker because she was not loyal to any one trading post. She would go to different trading posts to try to get the best um, uh, the best price for her weaving. She wove two gray hill styles. And if um, the trader up at two gray hills or at uh, uh, another, tr another close trading post uh, uh, didn't buy her weaving, she would try to take it to um, the area, the, the border town of Farmington and try to sell it there. And what was happening was that she was being blackballed that the trader would call ahead and say, don't buy it from her or whatever, and to teach her a lesson. So um, my mother was telling me that there was one particular rug that my grandmother had woven for many, many months and it was beautiful. And she knew that it would, it would um, bring a very good price. And um, when she went to uh, sell it, she was offered a very low price for it. And so she decided she was gonna take it somewhere else. And then of course, you know, she got blackballed so she couldn't sell it. And uh, they, uh, her and my grandfather, I guess made the rounds all around the Four Corners area trying to sell that rug. And they camped in some, in some farmer's uh, apple orchard. And it's really sad that uh, her rug went to the farmer and he gave them like two crates of apples for that particular rug. And, you know, that's, I found out later that that's the norm, that that's how uh, a lot of, um, a lot of weavers were sort of kept in their place, that they were, um, um, they were suppressed at 
um, having artistic freedom. And um, so I look at D.Y. Begay, who's a really good friend of ours, um, and her landscape uh, weavings are fantastic. And she dyes a lot of, uh, she dyes all of her colors on her own. And the way she positions them are very rem reminiscent of her homeland. Barbara and I had a chance to drive through where um, near Tsalani, uh, where D.Y. is from, and we looked at the surrounding landscape, you know, the, the, um, the, sur um, uh, the rock formations and the colors and the changing of the light. And we kept thinking, this is where D.Y. gets her inspiration from. And but later on, we, we told D.Y. that we, we drove through her homeland and we said, I, you know, I, I, your weaving just tells me that um, you're very proud of where you're from that the colors that she uses, that the, 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 the nice little curves that she puts in, that's a, you know, that, that's dedication to one's, um, to one's work. And, um, you know, she has artistic freedom to weave what she wants. And so do her sisters. You know, she has uh, two twin sisters that are fantastic weavers as well. And they are, they don't let anybody tell them what to weave. And I think that's the way that um, uh, the younger generation of weavers are becoming is that they are, are in control of what they do, what they want to do. Um, the newest young, youngest weaver that I know is Venuncio Aragon, and uh, he's from uh, Farmington, and he does a lot of dyeing, he does a lot of teaching, and he's such a soft-spoken uh, young gentleman that is so courteous, and we just love him and his family. Um, he has a brother that makes some of our tools. His brother's name is Artie. And he, we buy um, heavy weaving combs from his brother. And this particular piece, I think won at Santa Fe Indian Market. And when I was talking to his brother and I said, oh, by the way, I didn't get a chance to talk to Venencio, but if you see him, tell him congratulations. I really love the, the weaving that, that took the big prize at Santa Fe. And his brother said, oh, weavers get all the glory. The tool makers don't even get mentioned. And I laughed and I thought, you're right. Nobody talks about who made the looms, who made the tools, who made your weaving as straight as possible, you know, because we need those tools and we need these tool makers to um, help us when we are facing a challenge. And so in a lot of the weavings, we all need to talk about the people that help us get to these um, these particular type of weavings. The the tool makers who make our looms that make um uh you know I, when I go through a mid size rug, I will have gone through maybe six to twelve combs, you know, in various sizes and various weights. I will have gone through a whole basket of battens that I have at my side. And if one doesn't work, I have another one that I can pull out. And um, so we need all these, um, uh, we need the support of our family members. And with, if once we have the support, you know, the great works that are produced are very prominent. And I see it in Venuncio's um, uh, work. He's, uh, I've, I've seen some of his tufted rugs that have the, uh, the goat hair in it. Um, he does fantastic twills and he knows the history. And that's another thing is that I think when a lot of uh, weavers um, get started, they do one particular style, one regional style. And they may not know that some of those regional styles were based off of J.B. Moore's um, uh, plates that he created. I think there were 29 plates or something. And you, actually the Two Gray Hills style morphed out of that. Um, it was actually a crystal New Mexico design um, and it went through um, several years before it morphed into the Two Gray Hills style. But a lot of these styles were created, uh, uh, was created by J.B. Moore, who is non-native and was a trader at Crystal, New Mexico. Okay, next slide. So my nephew is Michael Arnell. 
Ornelas, Michelle Ornelas, and he um, started weaving when he was about 12 years old. Um, uh, Barbara is, I mean, uh, Michael is Barbara's youngest son, and uh, his older sister, Sierra, uh, started weaving much earlier than Michael did, and Barbara was teaching Sierra how to weave and and uh, Michael asked his mother how come you're not teaching me we've always had men weavers we've always had men weavers in in um in the Navajo culture it's just that I think in the 60s and 70s there was such a stigma against male weavers that traders not like to put male weavers names on their pieces so they would say whose name do you want to put on it and it would be either their mother or their sister or aunt or somebody and their 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 thing was um traders thought that uh uh customers did not want to buy uh uh textiles from male weavers and and it's such a shame because we have fantastic male weavers you know, Kevin Aspen is a great weaver, Tyler Glasses, um, uh, Roy Cady, and, you know, Roy's work is phenomenal that, you know, the phenomenal work that he does in pictorials is just amazing. So when Michael does his pieces, he's not doing a lot of um, uh, uh, trading post styles. When you, when you look at Michael's work, you can turn his textiles any way. Um, he designs a lot of it on, on the computer. And that's why I decided to show um, that particular photo, which by the way, that photo was taken by Joe Coco, who, who, whom you will listen to in the next uh, presentation, I think. Uh, we traveled with Joe to take photos of our first book, um, Spider Woman's Children. And he's a fantastic photographer. And he really brought a lot of our um, rugs to a, a whole new level, and you know, with his photography. But um, Michael has been very um, uh, focused in in uh, his work to depict comic book heroes and uh, computer games, uh, Japanese anime. And so those are his influences. Whatever we see out there, we get influenced by those particular things. And just, just like the same of influences from the 1800s, the Satios that came out, you know, the Lone Star, the Valero Star, the eight, the eight point uh, things, we see that a lot in, um, I think in Julia Jumbo's work. And so, you know, we have shared designs we have similar um, uh, we have similar colors, we have similar processes, but to this day, um, and now in this time frame that we're in, everybody has the artistic freedom to, to do what they want, and everybody is doing phenomenal work with it. Next slide. And so um, Barbara and I, when we were growing up, we did not know, know how to dye. And um, uh, our, our uh, uh, colors were produced by carding um, different colors together. And then you take black, you take white, and it makes gray. And you can have different shades of gray. You can have uh, different shades of tans and browns, all achieved by carding them together. And, uh, and it wasn't until, oh, probably about 15 years ago that I really wanted to learn how to dye. And um, I started out using acid dyes and I wasn't too thrilled with it. I made a, you know, I just made one weaving with it and it really didn't um, appeal to me. And so I wanted to learn more about the natural dyeing. And I started with powdered extracts and I loved it. And so I started doing like um, uh, uh, more of the, the plant gathering, you know, the, um, uh, getting rabbit brush and um, uh, onion skins and things like that. And I, I'm really looking forward to working with Porfirio on, um, on his dye concepts. I, I think that, you know, he, uh, from what I saw on um, uh, uh, my, my sister's photos that they took during the dye session, I can't wait to get to a workshop because I am forever learning about dyes. This is not what I grew up with, but 
I gravitated towards it because the colors, you know, they brighten up my world. I look at um, the pieces that I've done and I'm, I, I want to do more. I want to do more with the, with the, uh, um, the, with cochineal and with uh, indigo, if I can get my hands on it. Um, but again, we, it, 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 and it goes back to suppression again, because we were told as young weavers that we could not dye our, our wool. And my mother was 80 years old when she finally got to weave with color. And that's a shame. Um, and, you know, this whole suppression really, I, I think it suppressed a lot of great weavers. Next slide. And the last, um, this is the, the second to the last slide that I have. And it's really about our main source of income, which are the two gray hill weavings. And there's a lot of rules about it. And I'm thinking, who set up these rules? Who tells us that what an authentic two gray heels should look like. The rug, um, the tapestry on, on, my, on the right is a, uh, an award-winning um, tapestry that was woven by Barbara. And it's, it's housed at the, uh, the Heard Museum in Phoenix. And it's part, it, it came from uh, a collection that Dr. Ann Hedlund, I think, um, put together. I think it's the Santa Fe collection. I'm not really sure. Maybe Lisa might know later on in the uh, the question period. But this is a piece that Barbara worked on. And um, we, um, when we were at the Two Gray Hills store in the late um, 70s, the formula for what an authentic Two Gray Hills should have, black border and inset board that could be have design or not. Uh, it would have four corner pieces. It would have the two uh, geometric diamonds in it. There's no angles in here. This is all geometric. And then the two center pieces. The inside fill color would be the red brown. And we were told that this is the authentic two gray hill design. The, the, um, the, the tapestry or the, the rug that's on the left is one one whole diamond, geometric diamond. And for a long time, there was some controversy whether this would be considered a, a true two gray hills or not. And, um, but it's all in the eyes of the, um, uh, of the collector or whomever will cherish this rug. It doesn't matter. And who, and who makes these rules, you know? People that are not weavers should not be making rules. That's my opinion. It's our artistic freedom that we create what we love, that we enjoy the process, the carding, the spinning, the dyeing. All of that is a labor of love. And that when we finally put our, our uh, processes together, that we use the tools that our, our, our family members have made, it's a complete... Um, project that just screams beauty and I think that we're all similar you know there the satio connections are very prominent in a lot of Navajo weavings it's prominent our weavings um, some of our designs are very prominent in their weavings they you know um, Zapotax have um, uh, done weavings um, that the, the Tisnas plus style the tree of life, um, you know, uh, the, the, the chin style. I mean, we, we've all shared these designs. And I don't think that we, we own these designs. We are um, known by particular designs. And those, some of those designs are passed down because there are several designs that we use from our grandmother's time. And I use a lot of my mother's design. I use a lot of my Aunt Margaret's design. Um, and to me, when I talk to a collector that's interested in my piece, I will tell them about my family history, how it got influenced. And I'll be, um, and I always am amazed by how much knowledge they have. And so I think that the more we talk about weavings, the more we share the processes um, that it, it, you know, we, we don't have to say 
uh, these designs belong exclusively to Navajo people. And now some of the Zapotec weavers have gone through several generations of making um, tree of lives, of making tees naspas. So that young weaver can say, this pattern has been in my family for two generations. And that becomes tradition to them. And, you know, uh, um, and when it comes down to it, it, it's a declaration. This is a Navajo rug. This is a Satillo uh, rug, um, you know, whatever they call it, the uh, textile or whatever. We call ours tapestry because of the, the weight of the wool. And if it's a mid-weight, we call it a rug. It's a real heavy rug. Uh, we call it a blanket. And so those are distinctions that we make. But um, to me, the, 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 the connections that I've made with a lot of different weavers have enriched my life. And I'd like to thank everyone for sitting through my, um, my family stories. The next slide just has all my books and my uh, contact information. Thank you so much, Linda, for that. You're welcome. Fascinating to weave the family stories in it. I will say you have a terrific eye. All the textiles you picked out of the files of, of textiles I sent you with no IDs on them. I will, I will admit that. Um, I sent her to a box file that had the ones in the exhibit. She picked out all the Navajo ones that we put in there as examples of Saltillo influence on Navajo textiles and Navajo oh. rugs. <laughs> And it's so funny, your, your eye is fantastic. Um, and I know Diane Didamore has added some context in the chat if people have questions about um, some of those. She, she put in some information um, about those in there. And Darlene also put in the chat a couple of presentations on YouTube that you can find more information. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. But at this point, I'm going to um, ask Porfirio to unmute, and I thought he and Barbara could have a little bit of a conversation. He may have some questions or some comments before we go to the audience questions. So you have time to put them in the Q&A. Uh, just type them in there um, if you do have a question. Hello, everyone. Linda, it's quite an honor to finally meet you. Looking forward to meet you in person and shake your hand. It is definitely, um, for me, more than anything, it is just a celebration of coming together of Indigenous people uh, that through that throughout the diaspora and also, um, especially with the Zapotec people, you know, we're such of, uh, there's a lot of things that are very common to our practice and I don't, and, and, and I feel like we have not had um, an opportunity to come together and celebrate our, our craft and, um, one thing that I just uh, a, a comment that I want to do and and also uh, something that I'm particularly uh, very happy to hear is the freedom from the suppression or the oppression of a trading post and that I, it, it's great to see uh, artists like you and others that has been uh, focused on sharing their uh, experiences through their weaving and things that they want to talk about that to me it is uh, very special and that's something that i have been also trying to be doing throughout my career since i resumed my art practice about 15 16 years ago another thing that i want to uh, point out and this is more of a question for you is um how have you dealt and maybe how the what navajo weaving has dealt with uh, the folklorism, suppression or oppression, because I think, and you touch it, you touched on it briefly, is that the market, maybe the audience, would like to hear uh, the folklore and the romanticism about our culture, our family, and uh, it is. It sometime I think about it, it's just a continuation of maybe the trading post or, or middlemen and, and, and just be driven by uh, the economic opportunity. How have you dealt with that? And, and uh, what, do you, what do you think about that? Okay, so I know that um, there, there are a lot of uh, books, publications about um, interpretation of designs. And that always, always makes me cringe. 
much because some of the uh, designs are definitely um, made for Spider Woman, the Spider Woman cross, um, the whirling logs, very, very uh, prominent in a lot of the older weavings. Um, um, but the newer um, uh, weavings that are there, it's actually the weaver that can interpret that. If they decide to do a design, like I always use my grandmother's design for my borders. And when, when collectors ask me about it and I'll say, my grandmother has done this weaving for a long time. And I, I like to use it because sometimes I, I miss my family. Um, my, my grandmother's been gone. My mom has been gone. And when I'm missing them a lot in my weaving, I'll always weave something that will remind me of them. And so when I, and it, it's contributing also to my livelihood because when I set peace, it goes to a home that's going to be cherished and loved. And it's going to have um, the memory of my mother in there. It's going to have my work and it's going to have the, the, uh, the spinning that my sister did. And it's going to have the comments that my nephew made to me um, when I was weaving it. So it has, it encompasses the whole family and that's what the collector will have. And for me, it's my interpretation of my design. It's not up to a collector or I'm not a collector, I'm sorry, uh, to a trading post person or, or a scholar that says, oh, well, that design means this or whatever. And it's not true. It's very individual. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to educate collectors on that, that our designs are interpreted by the weaver. Yeah, I love that. And, and, and really what is tradition, right? Where mm -hmm. the indigenous people have been evolving for uh, thousands and thousands of years. And uh, we are in the 21st century that we're so influenced by modernism. We're so influenced by um, perhaps social media, digital, uh, opportunity of designing. So they're obviously continue shaping up our tradition and our culture. Um, you did mention um, uh, this one, uh, you, you made a good point about this. Um, and I continue to expand on that a little bit more, if you could continue to expand on that a little bit more. But before you do, um, I wanted to I wanted to ask you a specific uh, question about this. And I don't know if um, the uh, the people that are joining us tonight are, are aware of this, but this is continued to be on the line of uh, traders. So uh, in Oaxaca, maybe in the uh, uh, 70s and maybe in the 80s, traders uh, and middlemen discover Oaxaca, or not discover Oaxaca, but Oaxaca became um, a, a great uh, place or was, was discovered perhaps uh, by tourism. So the tourism started to arrive in Oaxaca and uh, so much of what we see today has been shaped by that. And uh, obviously with that, it, uh, wholesalers and trading uh, traders arrived, bringing Navajo designs to be woven in uh, Teotitlan and um, then brings it back to the United States and sells it, right? With uh, mm -hmm. completely Navajo designs and people that might not be educated or might think it's a, a, a genuine or authentic Navajo weaving. And that created um, uh, some misunderstanding between the Navajo people and the Zapotec people, because the Navajo, for the right reasons, uh, many thought that the Zapotec weavers were copying their designs. Uh, but really, us as community, as weavers, we really have nothing to do with, with all these things, because one hand, the Zapotec people are trying to also survive and try to make work whatever work you could bring can you weave these designs for me sure what size you need it for and off we go and make it um what, what's your what's your thoughts on that well um I, i'll have to admit that when i was younger um that was my attitude oh they're ripping us off they're making our designs and that you know people can buy it for cheap and you know they don't want to bar our buy our uh, weavings because they're more expensive and all of that. But as I grew up and as I started um, um, learning more and more about the suppression, it's understandable. 
And one thing that a lot of people don't know is in, in Bosco Redondo, when the Navajos were in prison there from 1863 to 1865, the government was bringing in Germantown uh, uh, wool. They were bringing in certain supplies for Navajo people to keep weaving. What a lot of people don't know is that the government also bought 4,000 Mexican rugs. I don't know if they were... Zapata, I don't know if they were Satillos or whatever, but the designs were there. Only a thousand made it to the, uh, Bosco Redondo and they were passed out to the Navajo people. So when the Navajo slaves were um, um, being taken to different households, Mexican households, Spanish households, colonial households to weave um, uh, rugs or reweave them, um, they were doing that serrated diamonds. They were doing all the designs that had belonged to, um, you know, the, uh, uh, um, the Zapata peoples. And, um, but how many of those slaves returned home? I don't think there's a high percentage of those slaves ever returned home. I think that a lot of the Satillo designs that kind of got carried on were brought back from Bosco Redop. And again, just like your people, you know, they took Navajo rugs to you. They took the Satillo rugs to the Navajo people that were in prison. And we all, we all suffered similar fates. Uh, most definitely. And that's why, you know, seeing um, um, artists like yourself and others that has been opposed to that, uh, uh, it means um, it, it's a great thing and that we can finally have a voice and can finally mm -hmm. us to make the choice what and when to make things. Um, thank you, Linda and Lisa. I, I appreciate the opportunity to have a, a conversation and, and thank you for uh, the opportunity. Yes, thank you, Porfirio, for adding to the conversation. I have some questions from the audience and some fall right in with what you guys are talking about. Um, one person was wondering, you know, you, you, and you've been both talking about this, that you speak of designs not being owned. Where does that leave the whole issue of appropriation? And is it, you know, and I think that it kind of falls into all artists and what we're influenced by. But in terms of these, you've been talking a little bit about that, and maybe you could address that word appropriation. Sure. Um, well, I had a, um, I had something that was very concrete um, on appropriation because I um, made a weaving in 2011 and it was a child's blanket. I, I made up the designs that I wove in it, including the spider woman crosses. Um, and it, it uh, took um, best of classification, best of division at Santa Fe Indian Market. The minute that that particular uh, textile got uh, published um, online and in publications, um, the El Paso Saddle Blanket Company picked it up and changed two colors on it. The rest was all exactly how I drew out my design. That's appropriations. And, that, and then that's for them to sell it, yeah. that's commercial. And they were selling it at $12 a foot. And that is such a, you know, it, it's such a, I don't know, the word evil comes to mind. Um, that's appropriations at, yeah. at, the, at the very core. And um, I don't think that it's uh, like if there are, when I said that uh, the Zapotec weavers were given Navajo designs and they've been weaving it for several generations, you know, for them, it has become tradition. I, I don't have an issue with that at all because we're all just weaving to survive. But a company that takes those weavings and use it and mass produces it and sells it so cheap, and it's my personal design, that's appropriations. Right. So um, speaking about traders <laughs> and, and people selling them, I, I mean, the, the, the one you talk to is very commercial and prints their patterns on things and um, whatnot. But, um, I have a couple questions dealing with traders. One is, um, given the power of traders, are many, and I'm not sure if she means if are many traders or are many Navajo um, rug weavers selling their textiles online. And then in 
in also with that is when you speak of suppression of artistic freedom with the internet, you can you not sell more easily directly to the public rather than through a trader nowadays? Um, it wouldn't seem that you could do what the market will bear, no? That's what the question the questions are. Okay, <laughs> that's a lot of questions. So, so it's sort of the, uh, the role of traders and the role of yeah. freedom that the internet's okay. provided to the so individual. So after Bosco Redondo, um, when the Navajos returned to the Navajo Nation, about 291 trading posts popped up. And every single one of those uh, trading posts dealt with Navajo rugs, uh, silver, uh, silver jewelry, um, baskets, pottery, they all dealt with the arts. And um, a lot of those trading posts did not champion Navajo weavers. They exploited them. Um, the credit system was in place where you could never get ahead. You know, you buy a can of peas for 15 cents um, and there's a 400% interest rate on that can of peas. And you can't pay off. The, the debt just grows and grows and the weavers were bringing rugs in and they were getting a box of food, maybe $10 in cash. And then the rest went to, to pay some of their debt off. And it wasn't until 1971 that the FCC came in and said, that's illegal. I imagine from 1868 to 1971, they had free reign on keeping Navajo weavers in poverty. And now that's why we have maybe less than 10 operating uh, training posts that are making a profit and all the rest are gone because they were doing illegal things. If we continue also uh, to see this uh, neocolonism, right? It's, it's which can receive the money first. And, yeah. uh, and I think um, we obviously not need each other. I think Trading Post has played a, uh, a big role, especially uh, in, if I'm speaking uh, in Oaxaca. They were the first one that to uh, promote Zapotec weaving, especially in the States. But at the same time, since maybe it's just so much focus on making money and the heart is to the side. So things like this, it's often seen and that it's just continued to be designed by uh, uh, suppressing the indigenous people. And we still see it today in Oaxaca. It's obviously Oaxaca is now um, is uh, the world destination. So many uh, tourists is arriving and, and continue to arriving people that wants to do business. And sometimes definitely they want to do business with the indigenous people, but they're forgetting the indigenous people. Right. Yeah. So um some more questions here um one is do you think navajo weaving would, would be where it was today if it wasn't for the traders making the first designs you guys have been talking a little bit about the goodness of the the traders as well as um the oppression and she continues i'm so glad you were breaking the mold now nice to see you again that's from Catherine stratherm if i pronounced it right yeah so. um well, um, the role of the trader did influence us and spurred us on to um, uh, the different regional styles. That, that is true. Um, and, and without it, I, you know, I don't know who's to say what, uh, what kind of work people would have been doing. But um, I do know this that when J.B. Moore passed out the, the, the drawings to Navajo weavers to, to weave the particular designs in the particular colors that he and his wife dyed, the weavings that he got back did not resemble the, the drawings exactly. And it frustrated him so much. So that kind of tells me that when you, um, uh, it, even in those days, in, in, the, in, in the 1800s, you know, now, Navajo still had the thought of artistic freedom. They wanted to put their own spin on the color combinations, on designs that they thought they could improve on J.B. Moore's designs, you know. Um, but yeah, we do have him to thank for the Two Great Hill style, for the crystal style, Clagato, you know, all the bordered ones um, that, that he uh, drew out. 
And again, they, they then morphed into something else as well. Um, you know, I, I still weave it because I do have collectors like it. Um, but I like doing my own style the best. It makes me happiest. Just to add on to that, um, you know, obviously traders has played a big role. And right now, with the experience we're having in Oaxaca, are the designers for the last five years, maybe 10 years, these are, designers are just pouring into the village, having their design made, um, specific colors and so forth work. And, um, you know, economic opportunity somewhat for the for for the weavers in the community, but one thing we need to think about is that with before uh, you know working for designers working for trading posts, the the communities and the indigenous communities was weaving for themselves and to trade with other uh, community indigenous people around. So um, eventually, it would have caught on to the market. And I think in much more respectful way and much more authentic. Uh, that will evolve through the people that wants to create the innovation. Porfirio is freezing a little. <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> you froze up a little there at the end. Um, well, you, you, you know, know what I just said is that, um, <laughs> you know. Uh oh. Sorry about that. My internet is kind of. <laughs> okay. I have a couple more questions here. Um, Nancy Russoff would like to know can you please share the specific saltillo elements that you incorporate in your own weavings? So, um, I, uh, you mean, um, it, you saw Barbara's piece, right. right? The first one that has the, uh, the lone, the lone um, uh, diamond. Right. Yeah, we, she used that a lot and she used that in, in uh, different colors. Um, the one that I showed has the blue background. Um, she also did another one that has the red background. And um, I did a couple of pieces that have the, the little serrated diamonds, but I actually did the, the angles. I didn't do the, the, the geometrics. So they're sharp to angle. And I, I, I don't have a photo of that, but yeah, it did influence me to to do those um, based on what I saw in Zapotec weavings. And another person was wondering, other than Spider Woman, as Porfirio mentions folklore, are there other symbols that you or your family typically use or other weavers do that you see a lot? Um, I, I yeah, my they're talking about Navajo weaving. Yeah, yeah. My, um, my maternal grandmother um, uh, went to a medicine man when she was, when she was really sick. And she talked about the medicine men using feathers to heal her. And um, in a lot of her weavings, um, she wove in uh, feathers. And uh, when I was recreating an old um, uh, period piece, Willard Layton era, era of the Two Gray Hills style, where he used, uh, he encouraged area weavers to use color of uh, aqua, turquoise color, red and yellow. I used, I, I did the weavings there and I put in the feathers because that's what my grandmother did. And for her, it stood for healing. And so when I talked about the feathers that I wove in, I talked about healing as well. And so again, it was very personal. It's, it's family, um, it's a family-based um, uh, belief that, um, you know, when we wanted healing, we went to a medicine man. Um, and I think that there are some uh, uh, Navajo weaving families that have designs like that. They're not universal. Uh, like the Spider Woman cross is universal. Right. And I know Porfirio uses a mixture of his own designs that he's influenced in environment with traditional designs coming from ancient Zapotec architecture, right, Porfirio? Yeah, absolutely. Again, it's just, um experiences and uh, things that has influenced us throughout the journey. But for me, more than anything is my interpretation of even the traditional textiles. It, it's obviously 
uh, has this traditional symbolism like the Cycle of Life that we see on the archaeological site in Mitla and many others, but also <clears throat> looks into closely uh, into uh, the sacredness of the corn, the food. I grew up by a medicine uh, woman, my mother's a healer and she still, still practice, practice now. So, so much of it is driven by those beliefs and worldviews of specifically the Zapotec people and mixed with few that are obviously, again, like the cycle of life. And I think um, people were really touched by your talk about the tools, Bar uh, Linda, I keep wanting to call you Barbara because I spent the weekend with Barbara, but, um, and, and so somebody was wondering about the portable frame loom and where somebody might get information on purchasing them. Are they available? Is Bevan going into business these days? <laughs> Well, my, my husband, Belvin, is a mechanical engineer by trade. So you know what? You, you need a mechanical engineer in your family if you're a weaver because he always goes through like what will work for us. Um, Barbara is, is, is the one who drives a lot of that. So she'll tell Belvin, like, I need my loom to do this or whatever. You know, our looms go up and down instead of changing the way that you sit in a chair. You know, when my mother was weaving huge pieces, she would start out sitting like on a little, um, like a milk crate sort of, uh, and then graduate up to a chair. And then we would double up chairs. And then at some point we would uh, put in a bench and then put a chair on it, make sure she doesn't fall. And then of course the dining table would come in, we put a chair on the dining table and she'd have to climb up. And one thing about the tools is that when my father made the tools, you know, my mother would be sitting way up high and she's weaving. She would drop a comb and she would scream at one of us kids to come and pick up the comb. And we're outside playing and we go, hey, it's your turn. It's your turn to go in and pick up Bob's comb until she got tired of that. And my dad took her comb, uh, drilled a hole in the handle, and she put a piece of wool there and tied it to her wrist. So when she's weaving and she drops her comb, she can just fish it back up. So, you know, if there's a problem and there's a really good mechanical person in your family, they will figure out how you can do your work best. That's right. Necessity is the mother of invention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, so these looms are not available as far as you know. Oh, they are. They are. We, oh, they we are. sell our looms um, during our classes. And uh, um, our best seller are those collapsible looms because a lot of times people collect so many looms and when they're not weaving, they want it you know, compact. Or if, they're, if they travel, if they travel to workshops, they can keep a project on it. They can roll it up, stick it in a bag. And um, you know, early on when I used to do a lot of traveling before 9-11, my favorite case to, to put all my stuff in was a rifle case. And then I kept getting stopped at the airport and they stopped carrying their <laughs> rifle case. <laughs> right. right. So if they want to contact you for it, it was that mm -hmm. address you had online. And could you repeat your email and we'll put it in the chat? Sure. My, my email is linda, L-Y-N-D-A, at NavajoRugWeavers.com. And so, and then the final question that I see here is just are many um, Navajo and I will say Zapotec weavers themselves selling online, not through traders. Like if somebody wants to buy one of your textiles portfolio, you have a website that they can go to. Linda, do they just email you or do you have a website where you sell your work? You know, how does that work? Um, uh, well, it, we're, we're kind of leery of us uh, putting our stuff online because again, uh, a lot of manufacturers pick those up and then they copy them. And so um, we do two art shows a year. We do Herd's Fair first weekend in March in Phoenix, Arizona. And then we do Santa Fe Indie Market in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the third weekend in August. That's where we sell a lot of our pieces. But I do, um, uh, we are switching to a new uh, web host and I, uh, we're gonna create a, um, uh, uh, um, a page to where people can go in with a password and be able to look at our stuff so that it's not just available, you know, to manufacturers. <laughs> do you have any because reports that, against like when, when those people stole your design? Do you have any well, reports on that? Uh, actually, I try to contact 
the um, uh, the Indian arts and crafts, but nobody ever answered the phone. And then later on, um, there was a reporter that did a story on me about appropriations. The 5280 magazine um, from Denver, Colorado did that story and it's about counterfeiting. And so I said, this is my, my, my tapestry that got ripped off and I showed them the um the catalog from the el paso saddle blanket company and i said look how similar they are they only change two colors but the rest of the design is all you know the same and so they contacted um this uh, the saddle blanket company and they said oh we've taken it we're going to take it off the website we're going to take it off the catalog but i think they're still selling it in the stores that's mm -hmm. that's my, you know i i have no way of getting down there but i'm pretty sure they are they also took uh i think three of Barbara's designs as well. And they reproduced them. And, um, and again, it's, um, we don't have copyrights. So it's impossible for us to get monetary, um, re, you know, reimbursements or whatever. Um, and and there, there's no way to control that. It's just not right. But. Well, I think um, controlling it is by talking about it now because yeah. I think we owe it to the next generation. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, oh, we just got a couple more questions came in and then we're gonna have to end because it's already almost 7.30, but oh. um, so one person wondered if you signed your work woven in, could that help with the copyrights? I know you signed yours, Porfirio. Um, do you have a signature of any sorts into yours, Linda? Uh, I, I, I started doing it on a, a few of them, like I'll put a little, um, uh, a little motif on, on the bottom when I start out, um, but I haven't done it to like my, um, the, if I do a Tuber Hills, I can't, I can't put that in there because it detracts the, the from the design and you want the, the full border to be absolutely solid. So we really can't do it on two grays, but our two grays are very, very distinct. I can walk in any gallery i can go to any collector's house if i see my sister roseanne's work if i see barbara's work if i see michael's work um and uh, my aunts i know immediately that they're the ones who who wove that they're very distinctive i i just want to say i'm so looking forward to meeting you perfect <laughs> and uh, looking forward to our dying session so i i just can't wait yeah, we're all going down to Oaxaca together as part of a program that Porfirio and Linda's sister Barbara, who lives here in Tucson, um, are serving as master artists with with some emerging native artists. Um, and so we're going to be able to see Porfirio's family studio in Oaxaca. Um, and we've been working with him here in the United States. He has his studio in Ventura, which you all are invited to on our travel tour. So um, we're so glad that Linda and Bevan will be able to join us in Oaxaca for that as well. So, and, and Porfirio, anything you want to say? I'm just honored and I'm just uh, happy and, and blessed to be able to uh, start in this journey of healing and uh, clarifying a misunderstanding um, and celebrating as Zapotec and Navajo weavers. That's wonderful. Yes. And I want to say, somebody said, um, Kathy, Karen Keating said in the comments, thank you so very much. Wonderfully informative and the cross-pollination of artists is fantastic. And on that note, I want to thank the National Endowment for the Arts who's supporting our Honoring Traditions program Barbara and Porfirio are participating in. And I just found out today that we got the extension of the project. And so we will be going up to the Navajo Nation after we go to Oaxaca, which is part of that cross-pollination and cultural understanding um, of the different cultures of, of weavers. So um, thank you all. And you'll hear more about that. We're hoping to the students will put together an exhibit that will talk about their learning of these traditions that will be at the State Museum and then travel to the Navajo Nation Museum. So thank you, everybody. Have a good evening.